on 30 East Shore, it's kind of a front and center house. It is in the middle of the block, and um, I wanted a no-nonsense kind of front on it, you know, where uh, it does have a door in the center of it. Um, but uh, I wanted a living center and not a hollow center in the house. And uh, dining rooms have always been a favorite point of entry for me. They are always beautiful. They're always kept like beautiful still lifes. They are always a portrait waiting to be witnessed and viewed. But when you put them in the center of things and when you traffic around them and through them, um, they don't become those stale photographs of dining rooms. It becomes a living piece in the house. Uh, it becomes a rock to swim to. It becomes the table you plan your trip at. It becomes more than your Thanksgiving dinner. It becomes the table of the house, basically, more than it becomes the dining room. It becomes the biggest single surface you have to do anything at. Um, and um, uh, in that and its lighting and its appointments make it a beautiful point of entry. Uh, and it's also a, a really proud and immediate offering. It's sort of a horn of plenty right there, right off the bat when you open the front door. Um, and it's the beginning uh, in that house, again, of a sequence of courtyard spaces that link it immediately to light. So in, in this house, it possesses something that uh, I love uh, in certain houses. It has transparency. The minute you walk in the house, the first thing that gets you is that you can see straight out of it. So I've always felt that houses that are, have transparency to them, when you can see through them, uh, they're, they are, they're truthful, they're honest, they, they show their intelligence and their integrity. Um, they don't have, uh, it is not a house of secrets. Um, uh, you have an immediate understanding of where you are and how it's put together, and it's given to you very fast and upfront. Um, and that is elegant in a person, and I think it's elegant in a structure um, as well. And so the, the formality, the symmetries, the alignments, the balances that are in the house um, make it a great candidate to play uh, in, with any kind of formal language you want, but it will validate as casual as you want to go with it um, because it has the discipline and the math to support it. Um, and so as it has a central dining room, it has a gregarious living space to the left that can take a full menu of furnishings. And to the right, it has what I call a destination kitchen, which is pretty much a kitchen that can hold any amount of furnishings and props. Uh, you could live your whole life in that kitchen, basically. There's nothing that could, it could not accommodate. And then adjacent to it then starts the story all over again in one of the wings of the house. Uh, the family room, but this house, um, this house stays thin, it stays bright, there isn't a room in it that doesn't open into the courtyard visually or, or, or literally. Um, it has breezeways, it has all the touchstones uh, for uh, a good country life. Um, so it's basically a rambling house, it is a compound. Uh, all folded up into a neat package. This house is a, uh, has sort of a New England derivation to its language. Uh, it has a gambrel roof, um, which uh, is a way of uh, making the house have as little wall as possible and a lot of roof. Um, that kind of diminishes how much of a, 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 how approachable the house is and how little of a bully it is um, by pulling its cap down really low, uh, piercing that roof, that steep roof with dormer windows on the front gives you kind of a sleeping language above and it gives you the formal language below. Um, the house is um, uh, painted dark like you would find in a house in Massachusetts or New England, um, which also uh, I think is, an, is kind of an elegant thing. I remember growing up, uh, you could drive through any small town and if you found a, a house that was painted dark, either dark bronze or dark olive, 
you always knew that the antique dealer in town lived in that house because they had more style than anybody else. And I was always fond of that. You could kind of suspect it just by their choice, being so brave as to do such a thing as that. And the house by nature is, is, is plenty conservative um, in its organization uh, left to right, that it's symmetrical, it has beautiful proportion to it, that's classical in its, in its order. Um, so it can afford to make a bold move, like be a dark color. This house has a, a pair of ingle nooks in it, which is a device that I, I, I first loved as a child before I ever experienced one in real life. Uh, I experienced them in the movies. Any movie that had a colonial background or a colonial setting uh, or an English setting uh, would, would use the warm fireside device of an ingle nook, which, is, which really makes you feel almost like you're in the fireplace. Uh, it's so cozy and it's so held. It's every emotion that you want to remember, um, uh, things that kind of made you who you are. But when you put an ingle nook in conjunction with a gregarious space beside it, then you get both things. You get the, you get the cozy thing where uh, really lovely things are said to you. You get the firelight on your cheek. You get all of the romance there. And, and you don't have to deal with the vastness of a larger context. But if you were to really ask yourself the question, where can I see this beautiful living room the best? Well, you can see it best from just outside of it, which could be uh, the gallery or it could be the ingle nook itself. It's where the room itself is the most beautiful because you've stepped just enough outside of the realm of it um, into a smaller dimension. The palette of materials that exist on all of these houses are, are time-proven materials. They are not the newest thing. They are not composite things that maybe even seem or are said to perform better than other things. They are the things that become more beautiful every year of their life. They are also the things that are worth maintaining because of their beauty. The copper flashings and roofs, the slate, the wood, the, the shutters that will sag maybe a little bit over time, which lets you know they're real. Um, all of those little signals are human signals um, that this is bone and flesh that you're looking at here. Uh, you know, um, part of, of the beauty of anything is its vulnerability. And, and that comes in some of the, the materials. And, and some of the beauty comes in its strength and permanence. Uh, the slate roofs and the stone and the things that will never erode and will never uh, change only to gain patina that will make it more beautiful uh, with each passing day. And, and those are really the kind of things that I, I, I zero in on when making choices for houses is which is what, what choice is going to be something that will look better every day of its life the longer it lives and what things won't ever look as good as they did when they were new. And I run away from that last choice uh, and run towards the other one. The first thing that I realize in any house that has any age on it is that the next owner immediately tears all the cabinetry out of the house. They gut it and they recreate the cabinetry. So when I think about where do I put my investment in a house, um, I am timid about putting the expression, the investment of expression in cabinetry so much. And so I tend to stay away from wall cabinets as a language in kitchens um, and keep all the cabinetry low, but do auxiliary spaces, walk-in pantries, working pantries, um, auxiliary kitchens that are adjacent so that the kitchen itself that is the social activity of cooking, the actual making of things, um, uh, its program is diminished down to lovely big surfaces and a lot of interaction between people and faces. Uh, it is a social center uh, for the house and right there at the end of its aisle are these great pantries and these, these other retrieval points where other tasks are done, but mostly things are gotten. You know, your little William Sonoma uh, pantry of goods, you know, is right there and you're not opening and closing cabinet doors and slamming and bamming and looking like you're mad. 
um, uh, finding things. You just simply set foot in the doorway and there it all is. Um, glad to see you and ready for use. In the case of, of all of these houses, their nature is that they're kind of a dream sewn up in cotton more than silk. Um, there is a, a commonality to, to its material that makes it kind and approachable and every day. I mean, it's, it's casual, but you can take it to church. All of these houses are American. Um, they, they absolutely are American houses, very gladly. And I, I think in terms of the timing of, of kind of culturally where we are and, and the things that we've done, we've built our English houses, we've built our French houses, French country houses. So I think the best thing to do is that we've made our tour of the world and we've built all of those mansions that most people would love to shake and get away from. Um, it's just to come home and build three really eloquent American houses.